I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about um, the carbon footprint of the military and how we pull together both scientific research and activism in, in the areas of climate and peace. So um, I should go fairly quickly, but we can discuss these things uh, um, in, in the chat afterwards. Um, so I'm going to be using some of the research that we published in two reports over the past um, year or so. Um, one looking at the carbon footprint and other environmental impacts of the UK sector, one looking at the um, EU's carbon, military carbon footprint. Um, so the first thing to say is just to explain what the military carbon footprint is, and it differs from a carbon footprint in that basically war is a bit more polluting. Um, and you'll see in this diagram um, on the left hand side, we've got some of the things that are normally associated with a carbon footprint. Um, so you've got things like um, military equipment use, so burning fossil fuels in warships, warplanes. Um, you, you've got the military bases and, and the energy su that supplies those. You've got the military tech industry, the arms industry and the supply chains there. So they, those tend to make up the, the um, carbon footprint, but on the right hand side of the diagram, you've got all the war related impacts. So you've got things like when when um, when a, an area is bombed, you've got um, fires that emit carbon, you've got deforestation, you've got um, the healthcare caring for the casualties, and you've got a reconstruction after the conflict as well. Um, but unfortunately, those areas there, there's very little data on it, so um, even less than there is on the carbon footprint. So what we did in our, our research was to look at the, the military carbon footprints. Um, and firstly, in this diagram, um, I show you the military carbon footprints in the UK. Um, and the Ministry of Defence, it quotes figures um, for its military carbon emissions. It has a headline figure um, that it uses in, in this particular year of 0.9 million tonnes, so less than a million tonnes. Um, but in looking at the whole um, system, when once you start to include all the different aspects of the military carbon emissions and the life cycle, we estimated it to be about 11 million tonnes. So we, more than 11 times the headline figure that the MND uses. And, and we estimated that this was about equivalent to about 6 million average cars. So it gives you an idea of, of what is um, what the military carbon footprint is and how, uh, how significant it is. Um, when we looked at the EU sector, we we came up with similar figures for carbon footprints where there was data available. So here's a graph of the six biggest um, military spenders in the EU. You'll see that Poland, we, we didn't get sufficient data to be able to make an estimate. Um, but for the other countries, um, we did come up with some estimates and we compared these with the um, official um, figures that they report to the um, UN Climate Convention on their military uh, figures. And you can see those, area, those aspects in the blue in these graphs, and they are tiny compared with the total amount. But um, Europe is rather small compared with the US, which will come as no surprise to many. And, and this is our estimate of the US um, military carbon footprint, over 200 million tonnes, so more than six times the combined carbon footprint of the EU and the UK. Um, and that gives us an idea of, of um, what sort of um, ballpark that glo the global military carbon footprint is. And, and it's several percent um, of, of all carbon emissions across the world. Um, so it's comparable with the civil aviation sector. Um, but these figures are either not counted or not classified as military uh, emissions, um, and they are lost or not regulated. And this is a serious problem. So why is the military carbon data so poor? Well, basically they have exemptions um, from the reporting process, let alone the target setting process under the various climate conventions um, over the last um, 30 years. And even now, um, what data we have is, is only voluntarily reported and our estimates are pretty conservative. Um, and the UK data, which I've criticized so much is among the best, that gives you an idea of just how bad things are. But there's a bigger threat to the climate than just the carbon emissions, and that's nuclear weapons. Um, and this graph here um, gives you an idea of, of the nuclear winter effect, should there ever be a nuclear war. 
Um, so what we have, the, the graph here is, is temperature change over the last 100 years um, that we've observed the temperature increase due to fossil fuels burning. Um, and then the, the um, little ticks that are happening um, around um, 2010 on this graph when the research was done. Um, give you an idea of the rapid cooling that would happen if there was a nuclear war. Um, and that's due to intense fires created by um, nuclear weapons exploding in, in combustible areas like cities, emitting lots of smoke into the stratosphere. That smoke spreads out, it blocks out the sun. Rapid cooling causes massive crop failures, um, ecosystem disruption, and you end up with a situation where you get a cooling um, in, in some cases, uh, at some, uh, some scenarios of a larger nuclear war, equivalent to going into an ice age in about two years. So that's just how bad that threat is and why it's so important that we eliminate nuclear weapons. So what's the military approach to tackling climate change? Well, earlier this year, the Ministry of Defence brought out a climate strategy document and, and there, key aim within this was seeking to use the green transition to add to our capabilities. So um, the, the Americans have put it more bluntly, more fight, less fuel. And, and that gives you an idea that they just want greener ways to fight wars. Um, and there are all sorts of problematic proposals in these. They're, they're um, interested in some of the most controversial technologies um, that are being proposed to tackle the climate um, crisis, so biofuels for use in military planes, nuclear powered vessels, um, submarines. I mean, you've seen the AUKUS agreement between the, the UK, UK, USA, and Australia um, for nuclear submarines there, which is a major problem. Use of offsetting and increased use of drones because they're smaller. So, um, and no consideration of alternative approaches to improving security. And that's our key element of, of what we think is a key element of tackling this problem and here i show um the spending um and how um comparing military spending and climate spending and how this is a a, a big part of the problem um so um i don't know where that that little squiggle came from but please ignore it um so on the on the left hand side You've got um, UK government spending um, in the last financial year. So you've got military spending um, compared with spending on reducing carbon emissions, UK carbon emissions, and it's about 10 times larger. And then in the graph on the right hand side, you've got the spending changes compared the, that are projected for the next four years. Um, and you can see the military spending, um, they're planning to increase the military budget by the last largest um, increase in 70 years. Um, the largest since the Korean War. That um, gives you an idea of the, the government's distorted priorities on this. While they're, they're reducing the, the um, spending on reducing UK carbon emissions, it's at a more modest level, and at the same time they're cutting aid. Um, we only have one year's figures for that, but um, that's um, a considerable reduction in, in those figures. And you can see it's comparable with the increase in military aid. So we, we're seeing a switch from um, spending on aid to spending on, on weapons. And that, at the same time, is leading to a, an increase in carbon emissions. So it's going in exactly the wrong direction um, from where the climate strategy that the MOD has proposed is coming from. So, um, oops, I'm sorry about that. Um, so our, our argument is that what we really need is demilitarization for decarbonization. So we need, if you're really serious about cutting military emissions, we need to focus on reducing the sizes of military. Um, and we need to do, the, do that first and foremost by improving diplomacy and, you know, and in, uh, improving and agreeing arms control and disarmament treaties so that, that um, all sides can feel more confident in reducing the sizes of their military and focus on the real problem, which is tackling climate change um, and poverty and, and various other things. Um, so, um, and then um, within that, uh, abolishing and eliminating nuclear weapons and at a broader level um, switching the focus from national security to human security which the UN has a, has a definition from which I don't have time to go into but uh, I've given a few elements of it there freedom from fear freedom from want and freedom from indignity so I'm arguing that that we need four campaign goals and the first one is we need proper 
robust reporting on military carbon emissions. Um, and the second thing we need is um, all military activities to be included within the zero carbon targets compatible with the Paris Agreement. And the key element of, of tackling those emissions is, is through a de demilitarization program or a series of programs. Um, and, and that to be accompanied by the abolition of nuclear weapons in line with the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. It was, um, came into force in, in January of this year. Roles for scientists and academics. Um, well, we need climate researchers to be involved in, in creating more robust um, um, emissions, military carbon emissions estimates. Um, and we need that for all the major military nations um, so that we get a, an idea of, of just how big they are across the world, um, even the ones that aren't reporting very well. Um, and then we need to look at, at um, scenarios for demilitarization that help um, make major reductions to those emissions levels. And in that, we need cl climate researchers and peace researchers to work together. Um, and to help us in that process, we could do with an IPCC special report on the military and climate so that uh, in the way that they, the IPCC, the Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has done special reports on, on things like the civil aviation sector. Um, and then we also need economics researchers to look at things like uh, arms conversion, transfer of skills and jobs from the military tech sectors to the green sectors. Um, and then campaigners, um, we need support um, for this process and, and peace campaigners targeting other campaigners, particularly climate campaigners, I've listed a few here, youth campaigners, trade unionists, um, so that they better understand the role of the military in the climate crisis and that the idea of just um, more spending on the military um, it is such a problem and, and we need to promote a different security paradigm and, and the idea that no one's safe until everyone's safe and um, you recognise that slogan from somewhere. Um, and, and arms conversion being part of um, the green industrial conversions and green new deal proposals and then climate campaigns we I'd really um, encourage you to try and include some of the military and security arguments in, in your work and, and particularly around some of the controversial proposals around things like nuclear power, biofuels. Uh, so the first step um, I would encourage people to do is to sign up. Um, there are various statements now around that we're supporting in the run up to COP26, um, one for individuals, one for organisations. I'll put these in the chat. Um, so if you haven't signed them, um, please do so. I'll stop there. Stuart, thank you so much.